Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Polly and I'm an alcoholic. And I'm delighted to be here. And what I'm going to talk about this morning, and I usually do this workshop either on a whole weekend or at least all day. So I'm going to really try to, you know, do a condensing here and put it into like an hour and give some chances for uh, some questions. I am going to be talking to you, or let me just put the the idea I got for this workshop comes from language of the heart. I'm not familiar if you're that if you read this book very much. This is one of my most favorite books. And this particular uh, writing that Bill did, he wrote this in 1958, January of 1958. And it's called The Next Frontier, Emotional Sobriety. And uh, Bill talks about the, what caught my attention is in this scriggly little writing right here. <clears throat> it says, this article is the substance of a letter Bill wrote to a close friend who also had troublesome depressions. And I am a person who has had a lot of, I can relate to Bill W. I'm a person who has had a lot of depression in, in and out of the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And when I read, when I saw that, it got my attention. And I began to read this article, and then I began to study some of the things that Bill wrote. And uh, one of the things we're going to talk about is uh, with emotional sobriety is we're going to talk about uh, character defects. And I'm going to break those down a little bit more. I'm going to go through some character defects. But all our character defects are because we have a faulty dependency on something other than God. And the bottom line here is, the bottom line in Alcoholics Anonymous is a total and complete relationship upon God. That's, that's what we're here for. It's, it's all about a total relationship upon God. And I'm going to read a little insert here from this, and then I'm going to go to the character defects. Uh, Bill's talking about that he was about to go into this depression. It was, and he knew that if he went into this depression, he was in for a long, dark spell. So those of you who understand that, fine. Those of you who don't, God bless you. That you don't know. If you don't know, it's great. But those of you who do understand that. And he just, you know, he just kept saying, I just don't understand. I've worked hard. And then he says, why can't the 12 steps work to release depression? By the hour, I stared at the San Francis prayer. It's better to comfort than to be comforter. Here was the formula, all right, but why didn't it work? And then he said, suddenly, I realized what the matter was. My basic flaw had always been dependence, almost absolute dependence on people our circumstances to supply me with prestige, security, and the like. Failure to get these things according to my perfectionistic dreams and specifications, I had fought. <coughs> I had. Blah, 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 I had fought for them, and when defeat came, so did my depression. There was a chance of making the outgoing love of Saint Francis a workable and joyous way of life. Until these, there was no way, wait a minute, I can't even read this morning. There wasn't a chance of making the outgoing love of St. Francis a workable and joyous way of life until these fatal and almost absolute dependencies were cut away. Because I had over the years undergone a little spiritual development, the absolute qualities of these frightful dependencies had never before been so starkly revealed. Reinforced by what grace I could secure in prayer, I found I had to exert every ounce of will and action to cut off these faulty emotional dependencies upon people, upon AA, indeed upon any set of circumstances whatsoever. Then only could I be free to love as Francis had. Emotional and instinctual satisfactions I saw 
were really the extra dividends of having love, offering love, and expressing a love appropriate to each relationship of life. And uh, as I studied more, and uh, I happen to be somebody who loves the history of AA, and I love to read about all the stuff that Bill did. And one of my most favorite books when I first came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and still is, is AA Comes of Age. And I love to read about we have the most precious, richest history. I mean, our whole history is about if any little brick had been just slightly out of place. I mean, you talk about Norm Alpe, of those of you who've heard his tapes, used to talk about inches and seconds. And, you know, if you if anything would have been just a little bit different, none of us would be here today. It's just so fantastic. And as I started reading, I started to see how we create the character defects. And, you know, in the 12 and 12, by the time Bill wrote the 12 and 12, he said 6 and 7 separates the men from the boys. And I first started reading that, and I thought, well, good Lord, the big book only gives each one of those steps a paragraph. How could that be so important? And But what happened was, is I began to look at those character defects and see what kind of faulty dependencies I had upon people, places, and things in order to cause the defect to separate me from God. And I began to look at step six. And Step seven is very clear that I have to ask God to remove the character defect. And I believe that that's exactly what God does. Just like the obsession to drink. You know, the allergy is always there. It's just waiting. But you know, today, by God's grace, I'm free of the obsession. You know, I'm not thinking about taking a drink. I haven't even given taken a drink of thought in a long time. But what happens is, is that I still have the capability to have all of these character defects. And I have to be ever mindful of them and ever asking God in step seven to continue to remove these character defects. So I'm going to go through the character defects, try to give you a little bit of the faulty dependency kind of quickly, and uh, and give you the solution. And I am one of these people that uh, loves our literature. And so, and I, when I do a workshop, I'm, uh, most of the stuff I do is all, and I'm going to say all, just all of this one in particular, is AA approved literature. It may not be the big book, but it's either going to be as Bill sees it, it's going to be the big book, or it's going to be uh, Language of the Heart, and I don't think I have anything in here of um, AA, AA Comes of Age, but those are, I believe in sticking with the literature. Our literature is so perfect and so God-given, I don't think we need to go anywhere else, and that's my opinion, and it's nowhere does it say that, because Bill even says we know but a little. We're going to keep learning, you know, keep learning, keep searching. And uh, and that's the fun part. And I think that's what workshops are so fun. And one of the things that I encourage any of you to do a workshop is, you know how you can learn all this literature? Do a workshop. It's amazing. Go do a workshop. And you know what you're doing? You're studying. You're studying our literature and our information. So give yourself, do something good for yourself and you know, pass it on. Go do workshops because that's the meat and potatoes of Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's how we learn because we go just a little bit deeper. Uh, so let's start with the first character defect, anger. Why do I use anger? To get what I want. To get what I want. To make you do what I want. Why do I get angry? Because things aren't going my way. I am dependent on you doing what I want you to do. I am dependent on the government doing the fair thing. Have you ever, you know, just think about some anger besides something really personal. Uh, I happen to come from Los Angeles, 
And uh, one of the things that used to just get me so mad and I could just get on a snow, a soapbox about was, you know, if you had enough money, you could get away with murder in Los Angeles. There's nothing, you know, the legal system, it's not fair. There's no justice. And all, I mean, you know, I can get on, I can get on a soapbox and be dependent on anything and get angry. But it's not my deal. It's God's deal. It's God's deal. And the solution is, and when I wrote this workshop, I did it like if we were gonna, like if we were gonna be taking a drink, because emotional sobriety, I mean, look in the 12 and 12, it talks about emotional hangovers. You ever had an emotional hangover? What does that feel like? It feels like you've been drinking all night. That's exactly what those hangovers feel like. So when I use character defects, I, I take it just like a drink. Because I tell you, enough of these in working in my life. And you know, this stinking thinking is gonna, sur is gonna soon cause me to do some drinking thinking. Because that's where it leads. It starts here. I think it before. We're, when I when people are in relapse, they're in relapse a long time before they take a drink of alcohol. So if just one whiff of anger sets up the compulsion to act on it, practice total abstinence. You know, anger for people like you and me is just not an option. We better fight. That's why we have the fourth and the fifth step. That's why we have the tenth step. It's all about trying to find out what we're angry at because I can take a little anger and build it into a huge resentment. It doesn't take any time because I can think it and think it and think it, and the next thing I do is I have a resentment. In the 12 and 12, it says restraint of pen and tongue. How many times have you called your sponsor and, I want to say such and such to them, and the sponsor says, no. No, don't say that. Restraint of pen and tongue. As I'm here to tell you, I have learned this through my life. And believe me, I've, learned, I've lived a lot of years. And I have learned, if you say it, you cannot take it back. You can amend it, you can say I'm sorry, but you cannot take it back. So what happens is, is what I want to learn to do is not say it. I want to keep up with the work, and I want to write a tenth step every night. I want to keep current so I don't have to say things I don't mean. If we were to live, we had to be free of anger. That's on page 66 in the big book. And one of the things that I want to say is, it's not good. Somebody says, well, I've never had any anger. I don't believe that. You are stuffed full of anger. And I love what my sponsor, Dottie, says. She always says, what goes down has got to come up. So what I suggest is, if you're a stuffer of anger, you better learn to write. Because if you can't talk about it, you better learn to write so you can get it down on paper and read it to your sponsor. Because it's so important that we get the anger out of us. Because until we write it down, we don't have a good idea of what's going on. So... No stuffing of anger. That When we say free of anger, it doesn't mean the stuff it down. I'm not angry. I'm not angry. I'm not angry. We need to know that we're angry and take steps in order to deal with it. Love and tolerance is our code. You ever get mad about something somebody you sponsor is doing or somebody else? You know what I've learned? That's none of my business. That's their walk between them and God. That is not my business. It's really tough because I really think it is my business. So I have to make sure that I let you have your journey and I have mine. Because you know what? My husband says something I love and he says, I don't have the right to deny another person their pain and their opportunity to grow. I don't have that right. Intolerance. What is the thing that causes the most problems in an AA group? Intolerance. How we don't, how we criticize, well, I'm going to do criticize too, but how we don't tolerate. One of the things that I have the worst trouble with in Alcoholics Anonymous is that drunks, this is 
This is Alcoholics Anonymous. Drunks are supposed to come to this fellowship. And I have seen people get so angry. Well, they're drunk. Well, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's where they come. And you sometimes drunks aren't all that great. So what do we do? We, we try to be very tolerant. And if they're too disruptive, well, a bunch of us will go and we'll take them and we'll get them a cup of coffee and sit down and start talking with them. But have you ever watched people, you know, just get all riled up or, or somebody, you know, is going to, is doing something in AA you don't like and you start, you know, getting intolerant? Have you, talk about a business meeting. You ever had a business meeting? And I look sometime at our business meeting and I'm just sitting there saying, oh dear God, just don't let a newcomer come in here. Because we are so intolerant of each other. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous says, a spirit of intolerance might repel, repel, that's the word Bill uses, repel alcoholics whose lives could have been saved had it not been for such stupidity. That's the words that Bill uses for the intolerance we will, we and I'm, I mean, I've been here almost 30 years, and I still see it today. Not only that, I'm sorry to say that I am a participant in it. I'll get up, you know, I'll get up, and somebody gets up to, to share, and they're, you know, they've got long hair, and all, they're all tatted out, and all of a sudden, you know, could this goof have to say that I need to hear? <laughs> And you know, that goof might save my life had I not been so stupid and not listened. That's the kind of stuff, and I'm, 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 I'm still capable of it. I have to constantly be reminded that this is not what we do. The solution, <clears throat> love and tolerance is our code. And that's on page 84. And the prayer of St. Francis, that it's better to love than to be loved. All of this tolerance stuff. You know, to do these things, we have to be good people. And I think that's what's wonderful about the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is what we're trying to learn here as people who have been really sick and consumed of self. It's really hard to be tolerant of others when all you think about is yourself. And as my AA sponsor says, Polly, it's not that you think well of yourself, it's you think only of yourself. <laughs> so what I have to learn to do is think of you. How would you feel? How would you feel? You know, how would not you feel? How would I feel being in your situation? A lot of times I want to judge really quick, but then I'll put myself in that situation and would I, having been brought to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous by a loving God and been given this program and taught day in and day out to do the next right thing, would I have done differently? These are the things that I have to realize, but it's so easy for me to go quick to judgment. We must be careful not to drift into remorse and morbid reflection because that would diminish, us, diminish our usefulness to others. So when I get ready to beat myself up about my intolerance and what I don't do right, so one of the things that we have to learn to do is to be tolerant of our own behavior. <clears throat> Last night, as much as, you know, I, I was so embarrassed. I mean, I know better. And my cell phone, I'm speaking, and my cell phone goes off in that meeting. And that's not the first time that I've done that. It's not the first time. It's the fourth time. She's counting that that's happened. I want to, you know, I just want to lay there and say, oh, you stupid thing, you stupid thing. Are you ever going to learn? And that doesn't do us any good to sit there and just beat ourselves up. Because when we do that, if I don't tolerate my own mistakes and try to learn from them, 
I'm not going to be of any use for anybody else. I'll tell you one thing. You make some of those kind of mistakes, and it keeps you, you know, keeps you right-sized. You think, oh, I definitely should know better. <laughs> anybody have a little self-pity? Mm-mm-mm. Self-pity is one of the most unhappy and consuming defects that we know. Why do I have self-pity? Because I don't think you love me enough. I don't think I have enough. What am I? What is my faulty dependency? I'm not getting what I think I deserve. And I feel sorry for myself. I try to talk with my grandson because sometimes he goes into self-pity because he's deaf. And I said, you know what, Ryan? God has paid so much attention to you because you have to, you have to rise above the rest of us. You have to take a step above. And that's because God knew you could do that. But Grandma, everybody, kids make fun of me at school. It's hard to be dependent on what other people have or what other people think of me. And my biggest dependency is that you have a new car and I don't. You have a big house and I don't. I make mistakes. And then if I make a mistake, what will you think of me? And then I can get into self-pity. Just that constant dependency on what I either have or what people think of me. Puts me into that feeling sorry for myself. Self-pity is one of the most unhappy and consuming defects that we know. It is a bar to all spiritual progress and can cut off all effective communication with our fellows because of its inordinate demands for attention and sympathy. It is a modeling form of mortem which we can ill afford. And that's in Asheville season on page 238. Self-pity is one of the most unhappy and consuming defects. What is the solution? Step six and, six and seven, the 11th step prayer. We ask God to direct our thinking especially asking that we be divorced from self-pity, dishonest, or self-seeking motives. And that I, I call two prayers. That's a step, step 11 prayer in the big book. There's also, I use the step 11 prayer, the St. Francis of Assisi's prayer, that's a 12, that's the, in the um, 11th step in the 12 and 12. This one is in the big book. <clears throat> Let me read it again. We ask God to direct our thinking, especially asking that we be divorced from self-pity dishonest or self-seeking motives. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous says selfishness and self-seeking, self-seeking we think is the root of our problem. I am a self-centered, selfish, self-seeking individual. And for me to be a person who cares about you and learns to love you and do for you and do that first so then it comes back to me is not normal for me. I'm a person who's very codependent. We hear that word all the time. That's not nice. You know why I'm codependent? Because if you behave and do things okay, then I feel better. That's why. I am not any, there is no self-sacrifice here. It does not come by, it does not come just normally. Everything I've ever done has been to satisfy me, even though I'm one of those where I looked so nice. But that's not it. When I have to give up self-pity and selfishness and self-seeking and care about you, that is not something that comes naturally. That's something I have to ask God every day. And that's what I do every morning. I do that. Just help me to be divorced from self-pity, dishonest, or self-seeking motives. Direct my thinking today. Avoid then the deliberate manufacture of misery 
but if trouble comes cheerfully capitalized, it is an opportunity to demonstrate his omnipotence. The thing about it is, is life's in session. I'd love to say we're all going to have, you know, everything's going to always be fabulous. And the reality is, and if I could climb into the kind of spirituality where, you know, I'm up above the level of humanity, then I would see everything that's happening as what God needs in order for this world to turn. But you see, I don't see it that way. So what I do is I try to ask God to help me see that and see that this is an opportunity for me to grow. God did not take away my house and take away my husband's job to punish her, to punish me. I don't think that happened at all. For whatever reason, I needed a lesson so that I could learn from that experience. That's all. I'm, st I'm speaking to a woman that I love very much, and she's very ill, and the next thing I know she's saying, would you believe that I'm sponsoring this woman, and now she has the same disease as me. How, what is our greatest as I, Our greatest asset is our past. If I haven't had the experience, how can I share it with you? I sponsor a lot of women who've had some horrific things happen to them. They could feel a lot of self-pity. I mean <laughs> sexual hurt, abuse as a child that is beyond sometimes anything I can even fathom. But the thing about it is, I can't share with those people because it's not my experience. But I can get one of them to share it with somebody I work with because it's their experience. What did I do to get above that? God uses it all. It's just there are no negatives in God's world. It's just my perception of reality that sees it as a negative. Everything is perfect. But I can go, I can go into poor me, pour me another drink over gaining weight. <laughs> so, doesn't take much. Broken fingernail, flat tire, you know, those kind of things. Those, those are, you know, those are reasons for suicide. Did you know that? <laughs> Give an alcoholic, have a fret, you know, a flat tire, and that's, you know, oh my God, I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> Resentment. Resentment. I feel it, and I feel it, and I feel it. And what happens is, is I just get angrier and angrier because it doesn't work for me. It does. I can be angry at, and what's really strange is, is I'm sitting here suffering with this resentment and the person that I'm resenting doesn't even know I'm mad. And I'm sitting here angry. Why? I've heard people say, well, they didn't make an amends to me. They don't need to make an amends to you. You need to make an amends to them. But what about me? If you'll just take the action and you make the amends, I have a feeling the resentment may leave you. Because what happens is, is I don't care how many people come to me and tell me how sorry they are for something they've done. That does not have any effect on me the way it has when I go make an amends to you. Something lifts. And what happened was, I have to admit that I am wrong. And I am dependent. That resentment is I am dependent on the need to be right. And they, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous calls resentment is the number one offender. And I can remember Frank, Frank Honeycutt saying to me, Polly, you have got to give up the need to be right. Because if you don't, the need to be right is going to send you into a resentment, and the resentment will send you to drink. Give up the dependency to, be, to have a need to be right. The resentment is the number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else. From it stem all forms of spiritual disease. For we not have been only mentally and physically ill, we have been spiritually sick. When this malady is overcome, 
we straighten out mentally and physically. How many people give you all kinds of excuses why they can't do things? I'm too sick. Well, why don't you go ask somebody who's really sick how they do it? And keep doing it. How do they do it? It's the spirituality that they have received from working the 12 steps in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous that has allowed them to be able <clears throat> to recover spiritually. And then because they have physical or mental handicaps, they are able to still be useful to God. Harboring resentment is infinitely grave. These are huge words that Bill uses. Infinitely grave. For then we shut ourselves off from the sunlight of the Spirit. That's an as Bill see it, sees it. It is plain that a life which includes deep resentment leads only to futility and unhappiness. But with the alcoholic, whose hope is the maintenance and growth of a spiritual experience, this business of resentment is infinitely grave. And that's in the big book on page 66. Twice. Two different, two different writings, he uses the words, infinitely grave. Grave means death. That's what grave is. That's how bad resentment is. The solution, the step four prayer, we ask God to help show them the same tolerance, pity, and patience that we would cheerfully grant a sick friend this is a sick man. How can I be helpful to him? God save me from being angry. Thy will be done. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous is just chocked full of prayers. And if those little prayers, just little one-liners like that, just one of the things that I just ask is, you know, dear God, just help me to be tolerant today. I just take it down that, that, just that small because it's my intolerance that will lead to resentment and anger. First I'm intolerant, then I'm angry, and then I'm resentful. It just, everything feeds on each, on each other. But when I am aware of these character defects and I can see the faulty dependencies, then I ask God to remove it. I wish God would remove all these just like do do do. I know he has the capacity to do that. I don't think he works like that. He gives me the opportunity to uh, continue to be able to stay humble to ask him. And I think these are the things that just keep us right sized. The book constantly talks about staying right sized. There isn't anybody that's got a bigger ego than an alcoholic. And I just sometimes wonder what my life would be like if I got everything I wanted. I think I would just, I wouldn't have everything I wanted. I probably would be just me walking drunk is probably what would happen. That's where my mind would take me. Jealousy. I've had a lot of jealousy in my life. And uh, had it all my life. But I really, really got it when uh, my husband and I got married. And uh, that was 26 years ago, so we were much younger. And uh, I just, you know, I just adore my husband. I think he's just, you know, I still just think he's, I still call him a stud muffin. I still think he's just <laughs> the best. And, uh, I mean, Dave loves the women I sponsor. And he especially the young ones. He has this paternal feeling toward them and I used to just drive them it just used to drive me crazy and I remember my son said to me before he even got sober I was having this big fit about one of the women I sponsor and James said to me mom Dave sees her as a child and you see her as a woman perception everything is about perception I have a disease of perception I don't see things. I think I see things. I think I know what you're thinking. I haven't a clue what you're thinking unless you tell me. And what arrogance for me to think I know what you're thinking. 
How arrogant is that? That I think I know what you're thinking. And that's what I used to do. I was so jealous of Dave. And fortunately, my husband has a lot of self-esteem. And he looked at me and he said, Polly, I am so sorry. I love you so much. But I absolutely will not let your jealousy dictate to me the relationships that I have in this property. And I am so grateful for that. I am so grateful because what I could have done, and I'm good at it, was manipulate him into doing what I wanted him to do. And then what would I have? An unhappy husband who had done what I wanted him to do, but by doing that, my dependency on him doing what I want him to do is not going to make me happy because I'm not going to be happy if he's miserable. Those constant faulty dependencies on everything, the arrogance, the arrogance of the alcoholic, that it worked, the grandiosity, as Dr. T. Bolt says, that you behave the way I want you to behave. Jealousy. Oh, I wrote that. No, it didn't. Keep it always in sight that we are dealing with the most terrible human emotion. That's in the big book. The greatest enemies of us alcoholics are resentment, jealousy second, envy, frustration, and fear. And that's on page 145 in the big book. What's the solution? <clears throat> Being humbled. Being humbled to see that what I'm doing and what I want for my own gain is hurting me and everybody about me. Have you ever been around people who are jealous? It's disgusting. It's so disgusting. You're afraid to say anything. One of the things I used to have so much problems with my two sons, and my oldest son was jealous of my youngest son. So what I started doing was I started playing this little game that I'd never tell him the good things that were happening to James. And, you know, my AA sponsor says, Polly, that is so dishonest and that is so manipulative. How dare you do that? How dare you not acknowledge James because Russ can't stand it? So I stopped that. And it was very difficult. But what I did is he was so jealous that somehow or another I thought my actions could make him better. The arrogance of that. But see, again, that dependency on you feeling okay, so I'm all right. Instead of being dependent on God, telling the truth, and letting God take care of whatever journey Russ has. It's difficult. It's, it's so hard. I just know I can help. I just know I can help God. And I can't. It's not my business. Humility, a word often misunderstood. To those who have made progress in AA, it amounts to a clear recognition of what and who we are, followed by a sincere attempt to become what we could be. I'm always striving, always striving. That's why I love, I love heroes in Alcoholics Anonymous, to have a hero, somebody I can see and say, boy, I want to do what they did. That's what I did with our marriage. I wanted a good marriage. How do you have a good marriage? Go talk to people who have one. People who are not having a good marriage are not the people to ask about that. <laughs> one of the things that happened to me one day was I was working with I, I was working with a young lady and she said, well, my sponsor says that I have to come to this meeting no matter what, and my daughter is going to have a volleyball tournament, and it's my home group. And she says, I can't miss my home group, and it's my daughter's volleyball tournament. And I said, does your sponsor have a child? No. Well, I don't understand that. You can go to your home group next week. This volleyball tournament is only tonight. And if you miss it, you have just one more time not shown up for your child. 
one more time. He didn't show up. I don't want to just, it's, you know, come on. Let's think about these things. <clears throat> Criticism. Probably one of the things that I believe is, I, I don't believe there's any such thing as constructive criticism. I criticize you for one reason, to make you feel less than me. It's the only reason I criticize you. When somebody asks me something, and it's just this, it, you know, there's nowhere it's written in the big book that tells me how I should do it, but one of the things that I do is somebody asks me something, and the way I sponsor is, is if it were me, this is what I would do. I don't know what maybe you should do. God's in charge of your life. But I know that if it were me, this is what I would do. Because sometimes, you know, I'm, I can be wrong. I can be wrong when I criticize you. I can be wrong. And by me criticizing you, what I'm trying to do is make you feel less than me. And I can feel it. Do you ever feel when you're just getting ready to tell somebody something and you know, you know, the body always tells us. We know when we're doing these things. We know. It's just I wish I could stop it. And what's happened, thank God, is I'm better at it. I'm better at not doing it as often as I used to. What, has, what I have learned to do a little bit better because I've suited up and showed up a lot of years in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous is I just am able to think a little bit better before I speak and think it through. Think before I speak. Take it to the end. But there are still times when my fuse is too short. My spiritual condition is not fit. And I will say something I don't mean. And before I criticize, and I can tell you right now, the person I criticize the most is Dave. And then my kids. And what I finally learned about my children and why I was so upset about them is my dependency was is I felt they were an extension of me, and how they behaved was a reflection on me. I used to feel that way about AA sponsees. You ever felt like that? How they behave is a reflection on me? What kind of arrogance is that? But that's how I felt. It's all about me. It's always right back about me. The deal is, if you are having a problem, you're going to pay the price. What is it that you said, Lorraine, your sponsor said, or you said, you're the one who pays the price if you don't do what I suggest? It's not me. You pay the price. I only pay it when I think you're a reflection of me and how you behave is going to reflect on what people think of me. That's the way I used to feel about my kids. Coming to AA didn't change a thing, just changes people didn't change the character defect. Continued to criticize. Fear. Nothing is more self-centered than fear. <clears throat> this short word touches about every aspect of our lives. It was an evil and corroding thread. The fabric of our existence was shot through with it. Sometimes we think fear ought to be classified with stealing. It causes more trouble. There's a lot of people that say you can't have fear and faith at the same time. I don't believe that. I fear a lot of things, but I'm still seeking faith. To learn to walk through fear. Probably the most humiliating fear I had was to have to and stand up in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous because I think somehow or another it reflected on what kind of program I worked when my husband lost his job and couldn't find a job and we lost our house and had to file bankruptcy and all that kind of stuff. I was so humiliated. 
humiliated. And I didn't want to tell you about those things. I was afraid of what you would think of me. And my AA sponsor says, you stand at the podium and you tell the truth. This is not about you. This is about you sharing your experience, strength, and hope. One of the things that I have a lot of problems with, I criticize, I'm a little intolerant of, I will have a lot of words to say, is when people come into AA meetings and vomit in my meeting. I'm one of these people, carry the mess to your sponsor, the solution to AA. Some of the Sometimes you hear these meetings and I'm critical of it. I believe that's how it should be. But you know, one of the things is I came to Bellingham and uh, I, was, uh, I, was I was critical and fearful because I came out of a really rah, rah, enthusiastic, clapping, hollering kind of AA group. And we did a lot of things and we had potlucks and we had a lot of fun. And I go to Bellingham, and you know what? Those people were staying sober just fine. And I had I was critical of that. So what do I need to do? Instead of criticizing them, I need to do what you did and create the fellowship I crave. Instead of trying to change them. Fortunately, I had sponsored some women who had done that had already moved. So a lot of my fear was allevi alleviated because I already knew that they had done it. But I had some faith. I kept seeking the faith that it would be okay. Having those fears. Fear. Some people are afraid of flying. But it's having the faith, I'm going to get on that airplane, and God's not going to let it crash. It doesn't mean the fear is gone. I can have faith and fear at the same time. And where Bill talks about that is he says, we ask him to remove our fear and to direct our attention to what he would have us to be. At once we commence to outgrow fear. It doesn't say we do. It says we commence to outgrow fear. After making a review, this is about our fear list in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, no, no. I take that back. This is step 10. After making our review, we ask God's forgiveness and inquire what corrective measure should be taken. This is not an overnight matter. It should continue for a lifetime. What I have to do is I have a fear. I have to find out what action I need to take to overcome the fear. And then I begin to commence to overcome the fear. But what I try to do is to keep the faith that God will help me to overcome this fear. I still have fears. I had fear this past week. We were snowed in for five days. It was wonderful. We had 20 inches of snow up in Bell and Birch Bay. We were worse than Bellingham in Birch Bay, and we had no snow removal. It was fabulous. And uh, Dave and I took out on the road to go to. He had a doctor's appointment on Tuesday. We got stuck. We came back. Obviously, we're not supposed to go to Bellingham. And I was afraid. I mean, we were just almost in the ditch. And I got that, you know, that fear, that just death frightening fear. And just sit there and ask, oh, just don't let us go in the ditch. And then people are trying to help, and as they're trying to help, it's just like edging off into the ditch. We were fine. Okay. Uh, blame. Anybody ride the blame train? If I blame you, then I don't, I'm attached to the dependency as is. If I blame you, then it's not my fault. If it's your fault, then it's not my fault. It never makes me feel better. Somehow in my head, I think it will. If whatever's wrong with me is your fault, then I'll feel better. So our troubles, we think, are basically of our own making. What I need to do is stay current on steps four and five and steps ten so that I am ever accountable and responsible for my behavior. Because if I become dependent and blame you, that takes me so far from God. 
one more time, I'm blaming you, instead of going and asking God for help. That faulty dependency. My dependency has to lie on God and God only. Because there will come a day, the big book tells me, when I have no mental defense against the first drink. You know, I could be lost on an island in Greenland. And I tell you, I may, I probably am not going to have cell service, and I'm probably not going to have an AA meeting. So I better have a relationship with God, because I'm going to need it that day. And I better be working on that day by day in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Depression. <laughs> the reason I'm going to talk about this is I don't think that there's anything more self-centered than depression because it is absolutely the height of self-pity, anger, resentment, criticism, everything just wrapped up in one. And it takes you to the darkest place on the planet. Now, one of the things that when we do the question and answer, <clears throat> don't even ask me about medication and all that stuff. I don't want to hear about it. One of the things that I'm talking about, I am not a physician, okay? I'm just going to talk to you about what I do and what the book of Alcoholics Anonymous tells me. I know that there are people who have other illnesses other than alcoholism. I am not talking about that. So, and I'm not a doctor. I mean, I feel like that that is totally a tradition that does not need talking about from the podium of Alcoholics Anonymous. I do not have malpractice insurance. I am not a doctor. I cannot tell anybody what they are supposed to do. I can only tell you what I do. And what I have learned from being so depressed that I have had thoughts of suicide in and out of the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was brought to this fellowship. I was court committed on a suicide attempt. It was not my first when I came to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I have hurt myself in sobriety because of being depressed. All I know for me is, is that when I am in that place, the only person and the only thing I'm thinking about is me. It is absolutely the height of self-centeredness. And what I need to do is I need to pick up that 200-pound phone and call you, and if you ask to anything about me, I act as if. And some people will say, well, that's lying. That's not honest. Act as if. And say, how are you? I'm fine, darling. Why don't you tell me about you? I sponsor a lot of women. A lot of women. I am so grateful to God that I sponsor these women. Because I can tell you right now, if I didn't sponsor these women, I would surely die. And what happens is, is me working with another alcoholic, Bill did not go looking for Bob to save Bob's life. Bill went looking for another alcoholic to save his life. I am not the end all, answer all, to anybody. All I know is, is I need to work with another alcoholic. I am a real alcoholic. I have the disease of alcoholism real bad. And I got a lot of character defects piled on the top of that alcoholism as a result because of the alcoholism. I have a lot of character defects. And if I were not working with other women in this program, I would surely be dead. So what I do with them is nothing to do with me. What they do for me. It saves my life. And all I can say is, is if you are depressed, if you have these problems, I have one answer for you. And that is take an action contrary to the way you feel and go work with another alcoholic. And in this article, at the end of the article, what Bill says at the end is that when all else fails, go work with another alcoholic. That will take care of depression. It's not going to be for me. It's not going to be in anything I ingest. It's going to be what I do as a member 
of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And the more I work with you, and the more I talk about God to you, and the more I do the steps with you, the better I'm going to be. Every time I take somebody through the book or through the steps, guess who gets to go? Me. That's who gets to go. I'm a book person. I'm one of these people that kind of works it that I take you through the steps first. I got this little format that I'll take you and get you through the steps. I can take somebody through the steps over a weekend. Dr. Bob used to do it in three or four hours. It's kind of the same thing that Dr. Bob did. And then what I like to do is go back with the women I sponsor line for line in the big book. Know more about the book. The answers are in the book. All of my problems and all of my solutions lie in the book. And I know for sure if I'm working with another alcoholic, somewhere, somewhere in there, I'm going to talk about God. And the more I talk about God, the better I'm going to be. <clears throat> the solution Bill talks about working with other people, and then he says, I was to know happiness, peace, and usefulness, and a way of life that was incredibly more wonderful as passes. <clears throat> a body badly burned by alcohol does not often recover overnight, nor do twisted thinking and depression vanish in a twinkle. We are convinced that a spiritual mode of living is a most powerful health restorative. Look toward God. I wish I could look to God and then help you, but most of the time I help you, and by helping you, that helps me look towards God. It's just the opposite of what the psychological profession tries to tell us. They try to think that we can think our way into good living, and I have to act my way into good thinking. Okay, go take a break and then we'll do something. As there will come a time when I have no mental defense against the first drink. And I better have a program that I can rely on because I may be on a desert island. I have no idea. But if I don't do the work, I'm apt to drink. And I think that a lot of people sit in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and don't do the work. They don't get a sponsor. They don't work the steps. They don't, they're not of service. They're just taking up space. And they think that their dependency on Alcoholics Anonymous, just being in a meeting, will keep them sober. I'm here to tell you that that's not going to, the steps are what keep us sober, not the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's my opinion. That's what I think anyway. I just answer the questions that, you know, the book asks, you know, where was I? at fault, and I'm not a good quoter of the book. I need Michael here. Michael quotes page and paragraph and line, but where it, in the 10th step it asks you the questions, you know, where did I hurt somebody? Where was I at fault? What I try to do is just ask myself, I try to read that page. I don't always make it, but I try to read those pages every night and just ask myself the questions on the 10th step. And if I need to make an amends, do it promptly. Probably the next day. I've had a big book we could read them out, and I can tell you, since I don't do so good off the top of my head. I don't know what the answer is for that. I don't know what the answer is for you. Uh, I know personally, I have said every year, or every all the time, I say, I can't. I can't take any more sponsees. I cannot take one more phone call. I mean, I just, but you know what? When somebody asks, I say yes, and somehow God provides. So I, I somehow think it doesn't have anything to do with me. And uh, because I, it's, I mean, if like a lot of times, I don't know how people do it, but if I took a phone call, uh, I mean, if everybody I sponsored, called me and talked for a very long time. Once a week, uh, I sponsor probably around 90 women. And if I, if I took a phone call, I mean, I would, it would be a full-time job. So fortunately, what happens for me is, is I have people who have a lot of sobriety 
And the deal is, is it's kind of, I feel like, this is just me, okay, and it was the way I was sponsored, is that it's kind of like you have kids and they grow up and they leave home because of what you've taught them and how to operate in the world, and they don't call you back all the time. What they're doing is they're operating and doing what you taught them to do, and that's what my sponsees do. Most all the women I sponsor, sponsor a lot of women. So if they're out there doing the deal, you know, what they do mostly, they'll have questions. Sometimes we'll have things that come up. But most of the time it's a check in. Just, hi, how are you doing? Because they're doing already what has been taught for them to do in AA. So you may, I know somebody says that my sponsor says I can only take so many people. I don't know about all that, okay? I just have to tell you what happened, what works for me. I want, sometimes I think, I'm not going to do it. And then somebody asks, and I, I can't afford it. It's, it's just not supposed to be for me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.